allegations as a, a Jew. Yeah, it's here somewhere. Here it is. Um, here's a sign-in sheet. If your name is not here because you're brand new, so just sign on the on the back somewhere on, on the last page where it's blank. If your name is here, so just uh, sign, uh, put a check near your name. <clears throat> In the uh, the book of the mitzvahs, that's yours. <laughs> yeah. See, I was already to give his book away, but he was smart enough to put his name in it. When you get your book, the first thing you do is put your name in it. Otherwise, if you leave it here, you're finished. Get another one. Uh, good morning. So uh, the first 18 mitzvahs we understood to be daily basic obligations, which means that you're obligated to be a Jew, not just in Shabbat, but every day. And uh, the obligations are at the minimum 18. Uh, uh, the first four obligations are obligations of belief and faith, which means you have to have a state of mind that has a consciousness of these facts. Number one, that there's a God. Number two, that uh, <clears throat> uh, he is one. Number three, that you love him. And number four, that you fear him. These uh, understandings, as we taught previously, and we'll elaborate upon maybe in, in, in weeks to come, are uh, uh, realizations that people come to. So how do you do this, Mitzvah? The way is, of course, to use your mind. That means you should be thinking every day. You should be trying to get awareness of God and everything that happens every day, every moment, every day, every minute. Something's happening and try to understand what is it? I mean, what, what, what brought me here? A recognition of a supreme being. And uh, the, then to go even deeper into that by being able to develop a, <clears throat> a realization of a singular sovereignty that there's nothing else, no one else but. Once you realize that, <clears throat> then you're connecting with the, the 101 of Judaism, which of course is Shema Yisrael. Um, the, the, the belief Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, the God is one. Uh, but then your, uh, your your thinking process has to go deeper into a development of, an, of of a sense of love and a sense of fear and respect and awesome uh, sense of, of of his of his presence. In addition to that, a person should uh, every day try to be a good reflection of God to the world by performing nice deeds and good deeds of ethical behavior. In addition, <clears throat> a, God, a person should actually um, learn to adopt good quality, uh, good qualities, good character, uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the uh, proper way of, of having understanding, compassion, uh, forgiveness for others, uh, kindness for others, and so forth. In addition, <clears throat> every day one should pray. Uh, for men, every day you have to put on your tefillin. And there are two mitzvahs, head and, head and hand. Incorrect. Hand and head. Put that in the proper order. <laughs> hand and head. <clears throat> um, you should wear, men should wear tzitzis every day. And the acknowledgement of God's oneness really has to be done every day by the recital of the Shema, of the three portions that, uh, that are written from the Torah that in fact, that in fact do... Um, let me give this out over here. <clears throat> that in fact, um, here you go. Uh, that in fact, <clears throat> um, uh, display or, or, or actually uh, uh, discuss and, and write about the, um, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, understanding of Hashem. Uh, that's the recital of the Shema. Uh, <clears throat> Once you have a mezuzah on his door, uh, in his home, and all doors for that matter, all rooms, all entrances to all rooms, and that then mezuzah should contain in its side, inside the, the portions of the Shema that we're talking about that will, in fact, reaffirm Hashem's existence. One should also make sure to eat uh, while eating, to bless foods uh, before, and of course, to bless after as well. And there is a requirement that these are daily things, because we do these things every day. Learning Torah is every day. Not just Sunday morning, not just Thursday night, every day. Pick up a book, learn something. Maybe you're out of class, that's swell. If you're not out of class, maybe you got a learning partner. You haven't got a learning partner, maybe get someone over the phone. You haven't got someone over the phone, open up and read something yourself. But make sure that every day you're getting educated. Um, there's a need 
to have books in your home. Actually, the real mitzvah is to have a Torah. Um, but uh, most of us don't own a Torah. Uh, if you want to buy one, it's about $80,000. <laughs> that's what I thought too, until I found out later. But, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's about 80000 these days. Um, there, are, there are people who are, can afford it, who have actually um, have access to it. Some people have a, a safe Torah by inheritance. I have a safe Torah of my own that my grandfather, blessed memory, gave me. But um, uh, one of the ways you can perform this mitzvah on a daily basis to have a bookshelf of li a library of books. And you should be out there in the bookstores buying them. And you'll have, when, when you get your application form, you've already gotten it, you know that there's a syllabus or a, or a, a, a bibliography of books that you need to buy. This is one of them. <clears throat> uh, there is also the need to, uh, every day, to give honor to the Torah scholars, give honor to elder, um, uh, older people, and, uh, <clears throat> and to connect uh, with, with Torah scholars by constantly uh, uh, asking questions and building up your knowledge. That means you should develop a personal relationship with your rabbi, which means you should nag me every day. Now, obviously, if you did that, I'd be a little bit, uh, I'd have a little bit of a problem. But what you do every day is you think about learning and you think, oh, that's an interesting point. I need some clarification on it. Write it down. And then maybe a day later or two, uh, two you, you, you call up and you say this and that. But the point is, is that <clears throat> you're constantly thinking <clears throat> and, and, and realizing the need for guidance and counsel. <clears throat> <clears throat> And finally, of course, is the uh, mitzvah number 18, uh, which is the mitzvah to respect the shul, to have a, a reverence for the shul, to have a reverence for the holy place of God. The temple in Jerusalem is no longer here, even though we do have reverence. When we go to Israel, we have honor for the kotel, for the Western Wall. But um, uh, wherever we may be, you have that reference to um, you have that reverence and fear and respect for Hashem um, and his holy place. When we come to shul, but you have to come to shul every day. So for men, that's an obvious truth. Thank you. Baruch atu Adonai Noi. Elohim Melech Olam Shachol Nilavari. Amen. However, the fact of the matter is, is that this can be done in a fashion in which um, and this can be done in a fashion in which the. Uh, Uh, this can be done in a way that um, that uh, you are uh, actively involved in the shul. A person should be actively involved in the shul to the extent where that person is a uh, ego. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that you take out membership in the shul, uh, which is, uh, let's say you take out a $12,000 uh, $1, membership every year for the shul. So that means every day you're paying something, a few pennies, a few dollars, whatever, but you're connected with the shul on a daily basis. And that's something that uh, if it's your shul and your community. You live in a community. You live in a neighborhood where there's a shul. You live connected. And that's very important on a daily basis as well. Given all that, <clears throat> given all that, we now come to mitzvah number 19 and mitzvah 20, which we talked about at length before the summer. That's called keeping Shabbat. Now, obviously, Shabbat's not every day. Or maybe it is. How do you keep Shabbat every day? Well, for a starter, you, uh, <laughs> you uh, uh, make your purchases on Friday or even Thursday, perhaps. Some say starting on a Wednesday, preparing for the Shabbat. So that's already half the week, right? Now, here is Sunday, and we're still basking in the afterglow of Shabbat, right? What a beautiful day yesterday was, right? And, uh, and, um, and that glow really lasts all the way up until Tuesday. So you might argue that Shabbat is every day. But, uh, but it really is. I mean, the, the, the absolute singular observance of the Shabbat really is, is, is on what, that one day. So it's not considered a, a, a daily. But uh, we wanted to talk about Shabbos and how we observe it and what we do. And we did that at the beginning of the summer. I'll come back to that uh, maybe a little bit later on, uh, perhaps maybe uh, later on in the, in the month. So uh, why is it called 
Shamsdik. Is that the Yiddish called Shamsdik? Yeah. What does Shamsdik mean? You said it wasn't mean. So, so, so it mostly applies during the week, meaning have, have a sense of. <laughs> but Shabbos Dick really means what's appropriate for Shabbos. Um, wearing shorts is not appropriate for Shabbos. It's not Shabbos Dick to wear shorts. Are we all in agreement? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, you know, whatever you're wearing in your house. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the, the only use of shorts I ever found was either at a baseball field or at a, a swimming pool. I never really found why there were why people in Bob Bobby are gonna wear shorts, but uh, I mean I, I mean I, I see these people walking in the street <laughs> publicly with shorts, I think it's hysterical. But again, that's Mets, you know, I'm uh, I'm a little uh, sheltered that way. <clears throat> um but 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 uh, certainly I mean uh, I mean if if you're wearing a uh, a, a you know a, a clothes that are not appropriate for Shabbos, that's a Shabbos day. If you're eating foods, I mean. What am I eating? I'm eating a hot dog for Shabbos. I mean, I'm eating a pizza for Shabbos. I mean, I mean, I love pizza too, but there's a time and a place, right? Shabbos is not the place. So it, that's the idea of Shabbos, Nick. Uh, by, and whether it's clothing or food or uh, anything else that, that, that tends to just give you that sense of there's a special day. Uh, that's aside from the technical aspects of Shabbos, the 39 forbidden labors and all the details that go into his observance. That's a whole lot more and a whole lot more important, but that we'll talk about at a later time. Once you get into Shabbos, which is 18 and 19, uh, 19 and 20, I'm sorry. 19 is to make the Kiddush on Shabbos. 20 is to refrain from work on Shabbos. Um, why is refraining from work on Shabbos a positive mitzvah, not a negative? Remember, we're talking about positives now. The negative mitzvahs are in the second half of the book. The first half is 77 positive. So mitzvah number 19 positive, declare the Shabbos holy with words. In one word, what is that called? Say it. That's the way. Kiddush. Fast and sharp. Um, so that's positive. No, get a cup of wine, say the words, drink some wine, and, you, and you're you did the mitzvah. Number 20, to rest from work. That's not a negative, it's a positive. Now there are negatives too. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't do 39 stuff, which is all really one mitzvah. Don't do any work on Shabbos. But the positive of that is, and it's a positive, you should create a spirit of rest on Shabbos. So let's understand it. Is it forbidden to read a newspaper on Shabbos? Not technically. There's nothing that's in the 39 labels that said you can't read a newspaper. But it seems to me that if you would, it would not really create a nice Shabbos atmosphere, would it? I mean, I never saw a newspaper lately anyway that has nothing but junk in it. This guy killed that guy. That guy killed that guy. This guy says this guy is mauled, and this guy is beaten up, and and and, and I was, I was great news in the world, you know. That's not what you want to read. I don't want to read it all week, frankly. I mean, I've read a newspaper in thank God, I don't know, maybe a dozen years. Of course, uh, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on, which is even greater. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but 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 um, you want to do things that don't. Disturb the Shabbos. Okay. Can I turn on a television on Shabbos? No. Of course not. It's electricity. Could I put my television on a timer for 2 p.m. Shabbos afternoon when the championship game was going on? Now, I don't know if you're interested in the championship game, but I am. Especially if it was my team. And I'm... But it's not Shabbos. But it's not Shabbos. So the, the TV will go on automatically. Right? Technically, I haven't done a thing wrong, but in the spirit of Shabbos, for the next two hours that I saw this game, I didn't think a thing about God. I didn't think a <laughs> thing about Shabbos. I completely disassociated. That's not what you want to do. So that's not what we call Shabbos appropriate. That's called create for yourself a positive mitzvah, mitzvah number 20. Create for yourself a positive, restful, uh, and, and, and serene, and spiritual atmosphere of the Shabbos. And that's a positive. 
So that's 19 and 20. <clears throat> and the reason I mention these two mitzvahs to you is because now we come to mitzvahs 21 through 37. And in mitzvahs 21 through 37, thank you. <clears throat> in mitzvahs 21, did you get this, uh, uh, Marissa? Marissa? Yeah. Mitzvahs 21 through 37 <clears throat> are the mitzvahs of the holidays. Now, obviously, these are not daily. The holiday comes once a year, right? So it, it, they, these were occasional mitzvahs. It, it, it's, it's Rosh Hashanah, it's Yom Kippur, it's Sukkot, it's whatever. So point is, is that these are not daily. They are occasional. Uh, and occasions are important to commemorate and to observe and, and, and connect with. Uh, what are our holidays of the year? Now, nothing can be more important for learning about Judaism than to know the calendar and to know the holiday system of the calendars. Now, I gave out a printout, I believe, some time ago <clears throat> about the calendar, and it's able to memorize the months. Uh, if you memorize the months, you should be familiar with month number one. However, there's a dispute as to what month number one is. Is it Nisan or is it Tishrei? Is it the spring? or the fall, that's the question. And so of course, <clears throat> well, you understand it as follows. In the fall, the month of Tishrei begins Rosh Hashanah of the new year. That is the anniversary of creation. That's when the world began, which simply means that every Tishrei, the world gets a year older. But Nisan in the spring, when we celebrate Pesach, that's the new year for the Jewish people. I know everyone says the Jewish New Year is Rosh Hashanah, but it's really not. It's really the world's new year. The new year for us as a people is Pesach, Nisan. So <clears throat> right now we're in the, uh, the end of the summer. We're beginning the month of September and the month of Elul, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And this month really is a prelude to the beginning of the world's new year, the birthday of the world, the birthday of actually of mankind. And... Um, uh, that, that will be uh, in a month from now, because today is the first day of Elul. So we wish each other happy. Chodesh. Chodesh Tov. Good new year. A good new month. Okay. <clears throat> so let's understand um, that in our book, um, uh, books to, uh, the, the, actually the, the holidays start from Pesach. Um, so I would, first of all, be mindful to tell everyone that mitzvah number 21, which is right after Shabbos, is the mitzvah of being happy on festivals. That means to say that when you have a holiday, a Chag or a Yom Tov, there's a din called Simcha. It's a rule. You have to be happy. <laughs> and um, it's different than Shabbat. Shabbat is a little different than happiness. Shabbat is pleasure. There's a difference. Pleasure is a far deeper uh, experience. Um, uh, joy, happiness is a response to, to, uh, to a stimulus. Um, Shabbat coming every week and enveloping the whole week, as I mentioned a moment ago, really is a full sense of, of, of in-depth pleasure it's called the karata le Shabbat Oneg. In Hebrew, Oneg means pleasure. Shabbat should be that thing of a sense of, of a complete uh, rest from all the issues of the world. Uh, and that is manifested through the prohibition of 39 forbidden things to do. Holidays, Chagim, are a little less. Less restriction less pleasure. What is permitted on holidays? You're permitted to light up a fire. And I, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. You're not permitted to light up a fire. You are permitted to transfer a fire. Fire in general is absolutely forbidden, as you well know. Here you go. <clears throat> fire is it's forbidden, as you well know. Um, and and uh, lighting a fire, striking a match, uh, any of that sort of stuff uh, is uh, uh, creative and forbidden on Shabbos. And um, cooking is forbidden on Shabbos. And 
uh, carrying objects from, per, from private areas to public areas or vice versa is equally forbidden on Shabbos. Those kind of prohibitions tend to demand that all that, that you may need from these items have to be done beforehand. So that Shabbos is a complete freedom from all that stuff. Uh, the holiday does give a little bit of a leniency. The holiday is not as powerful as the Shabbos. Therefore, the holiday uh, is forbidden in all, in 36 prohibitions. It is permitted to cook on the holiday. It is permitted to carry on the holiday. It is also permitted to uh, extend fire on the holiday. But what are the restrictions? So the holiday restriction is that you can't light a fire, you can't extinguish a fire, but you can transfer a fire. That's an important message to know. Secondly, <clears throat> um, in carrying, you can only carry those items that you need for food, for prayer, shul, home, whatever. Uh, you, you don't, we don't just carry, um, I don't carry my, my, my wallet with me on, on the holiday. And as far as cooking is concerned, it's also a restriction. And the cooking restriction is you can only cook for that day. So if the holiday begins as Rosh Hashanah will begin on Sunday night. Can I cook on Sunday night for Sunday night? Well, of course I can. Now, I can't. Uh, I would ordinarily have to prepare Sunday afternoon if it was a Shabbos, correct? Well, you know, Friday. But I don't have to do that now. It's a good idea to do so anyway. But if I want to heat up, I don't need any uh, any uh, a, a tin or blech to, 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 to uh, put on the stove or a plata. I can just simply, <clears throat> simply put it on the stove as long as the flame is existent or transfer the flame from one burner to the next and put the food on and cook anything I want for Sunday night on Sunday night. Can I cook on Sunday night for Monday morning? Yeah. Why not? Same day. Same day. Can I cook on Monday morning for Monday afternoon? No problem. Can I cook on Monday afternoon for Monday night? It's a different day. And of course, there's the first day of Rosh Hashanah, second day of Rosh Hashanah. When you have these two-day holidays, you got to remember that you can only cook on that day for that day and not beyond. Why is this restriction in effect? Simply because if you were permitted to cook for the next day, then what you'd be doing, you'd be cooking all over the place. And you spend the holiday cooking and then, and then storing away for the next three weeks. That's not what the holiday is made for. The holiday is made to enjoy to celebrate, to have festive meals, to go to shul, to daven, to have a spiritual experience. So therefore, the idea of, um, of, uh, of cooking only is for that given day. So <clears throat> therefore, we say, the karata le shabbat oneg, call shabbat pleasure, but with the holiday, the samachta bechagecha, rejoice with your holiday. Difference between rejoicing and pleasure. Shabbat is pleasure. Everything's forbidden. Um, the Chag, a couple of permissions. Therefore, you don't get up to that pleasure level, but you get into what we call the Simcha level. This level of happiness, of joy for the moment. In other words, experiencing, experiencing what the holidays, uh, the message the holiday is supposed to convey. And so, um, these, uh, this will apply to all the holidays, and we have to identify the holidays. So we identify them on number, follow me, number 20, 20 um, uh, where is it here? Do, 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 do. Uh, number 25, skip to 25, rest from work on the first day of Passover, which means, of course, the first two. Uh, 27, rest from work on the seventh day of Passover, which means, again, the first two. And the last two, I'm sorry, seven and eight. Uh, so you've got eight days of holiday of which you have uh, four days in between in which you may go to work. That's called Chola Moed. First two, you must uh, not go to work. And the last two, you don't go to work. Uh, then, of course, there's a holiday of wrestling from work on Shavuot on number 28. In between these mitzvahs, you're going to see, uh, if you see them listed in the, in the list. It's because these are mitzvahs or extra mitzvahs that are connected to the particular holiday. For instance, the uh, prohibition of chametz and the obligation of matzah is, 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 is uh, connected to Pesach. Uh, <clears throat> the accounting of the Omer between Pesach and Shavuos. 
And now we come to mitzvah number 29. Number 29 is the mitzvah to rest from work. Another holiday. Whenever you see rest from work, that's called a Shabbat, right? That means you're resting from the work on this given day. This one is on 29th, the first day of Tishrei, which is known as Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, the head of the year. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that is two days um, uh, nowadays. <clears throat> um, then you have the rest from work on Yom Kippur, number 31. And then you have 34 resting from Sukkot, uh, and, um, and then the resting of on 37, the resting from Shemini Atzeret. And so basically, what, you, what I've mentioned here to you is five holidays. And you need to know those five in two orders. The five holidays are Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. To understand this is to understand that there are two systems. One is a system called the Shalosh Regalim, the three pilgrimage festivals. Those are the festivals in which you, um, you, you, you would uh, make a trip to Jerusalem, to Yerushalayim. Nowadays, we don't do this because we don't have the temple anymore, as I said. It's one of the myths that is not applicable. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, these three holidays are called major festival, Shalosh Regalim, three pilgrimages. You use your legs, Regalim, to get to Yerushalayim. Uh, the mitzvah is to walk it, actually. Uh, even if you transport yourself to the set, to the opening of the city, then you go from there to the Beis Amigdash uh, on foot. But uh, the, the celebrations are really national in, in, um, in spirit and uh, very festive. Pesach, freedom, left Egypt. Celebrate. Shavuos, get the Torah. Celebrate. Festive. Sukkot. Shem took care of us in the desert, protected us from all the elements for 40 years. Put us in little boots, little huts. We build one. We celebrate one. We sing, we dance. We have a wonderful time. Those are called the three festivals that are really festive, really joyous, really filled with uh, celebration, happiness, great food, uh, good clothing, and, uh, and 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 a lot of a, a lot of spirited singing and dancing. Then there's another system. The other system is called more of a personal level, not such a national one, more personal. It's called the Yomim Noroyim, the days of awe. The days of awe are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is uh, really not really a Jewish holiday at all. As I said, it's a celebration of the world's creation. The whole world should be celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Never, the Goyim don't know any better. They don't know. Celebrate the, they, they celebrate their New Year's uh, some other way, some other day, right? <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year. The world celebrates its birthday. God takes stock of his world that he created, particularly of mankind that he created, and judges them individually as well as collectively, which simply means that the holiday has to be observed with a lot of seriousness. Yet it's still a holiday, still festive. This trappings, festive trappings is food, there's a festive meal, there's a <clears throat> and, and, but it's a very serious day. You're in court. You ever see anyone going in court singing and dancing? Never. Never. You look at that judge in front of you and you go, <laughs> all right? And the judge on Rosh Hashanah is the king of all kings, the holy one, blessed be he. Not a human flesh and blood judge who can be bribed, but someone who cannot be bribed. Who knows it all, including not only what we're doing, but also what we're thinking. And um, we've got to answer for it all. That's Rosh Hashanah. <sighs> the Day of Judgment is an historical um, uh, uh, commemoration of that creation. Just like the other three days were commemorating a Jewish experience, this day is commemorating a world experience, but we as Jews are observing it 
as our holiday. Uh, if people want to pray to God on that day, which we should as Jews for good judgment, and the Goyim don't know any better to do that, we will pray for them. In other words, we don't exist in a vacuum. We exist in a world. There's a big world out there, right? Much more non-Jews than Jews. And this world has to survive for us to survive. So when we pray for God for the next coming year, I pray for myself, pray for my family, I pray for my people, and I pray for the world at large. And that's how we connect with Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. Uh, <clears throat> But then there's a very funny, funny, fascinating holiday that comes right after it. And it's a holiday in which, uh, sorry, I'm in cheer, call me back. I would have been more rude, but I, was, I didn't want to get a bad impression on anybody. I mean, I usually I try to be very rude on the phone if I, if I can, <clears throat> especially if I'm in the middle of a class. Um, <clears throat> This Yom Kippur that follows Rosh Hashanah has a very strange historical background. Again, we're, we're celebrating a, a holiday based upon what happened many, many years ago, historically, on this day. What happened in Yom Kippur? Anybody know? What happened in Yom Kippur that made it into a Yom Kippur? What happened? Well, what happened is very interesting. Uh, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, we did this with the timeline a couple of weeks ago when we were in class on the parasha. We did the timeline. We talked about <clears throat> the Jews leaving Egypt, getting to Mount Sinai uh, seven weeks later to get the Torah, and then 40 days to Moshe Rabbeinu to get the tablets. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down with those tablets and with the Torah 40 days later after Shavuot, he sees a tragedy. What's the tragedy? Egel Azahab, golden calf, breaks the tablets. Makes the people suffer for a terrible event. Terrible. Betrayal of God. Took you out of Egypt, and, and there you are, uh, <laughs> worshiping a golden calf. And so uh, Moshe Rabbeinu gets them to do tshuva, to repent. How do you repent? First thing you do is you look in the mirror, and you say, you are a bum. You're a bad guy. You did the wrong thing. Now, I guess you don't have to say I'm a bad guy, but I do have to say I did the wrong thing. We don't make judgments and call ourselves bad, but we do say we did bad. And I do, I said this lesson over and as far as children are concerned too. You never say your son is bad, your daughter is bad. What you say is you did a bad thing. And so, if you admit that you did bad, and that's really what we all need to do during this, this whole period of time. If you admit that you did bad, so then you can regret it. I really regret it. I had poor judgment. I really regret that I did the wrong thing. Now, what are the wrong things? Let's identify three sins. Of all the mitzvahs, they're all fall into any one of three categories. These are the three categories that people mess up with. Either they commit a sin of error, they weren't thinking, or B, they were lusting for something, like their cell phone or something, and C, they simply said, I had it with you, God, I'm rebelling. Basically, it's error, lust, and rebellion. Those are the three kinds of sins. Every one of our sins, every one of our mistakes fall into these three categories. My Rebbe, of Noah Weinberg of blessed memory said that if you think about it, every wrongdoing that we do has all three components. If we do something wrong, obviously we're not thinking because if we were thinking, we wouldn't make that mistake. But at the same time, why wasn't I thinking? Because I was a little interested in maybe finding a way to get the chance to do it. I had a little desire. And when I had that desire, and that's something else that's more important to me than God, I betrayed God. So all sins are like that. Now, let's say <clears throat> I um, uh, uh, find the uh, 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 question of, am I permitted to do this in Shabbat or not? And uh, I can't call the rabbi 
because I'm not supposed to use the phone. And even if I do it, Robert's not going to answer it anyway. So what am I going to do? So I figure it out, figure out this. Am I permitted to do this? Not permitted to do this? And uh, I think about it. I said, stop thinking already. Okay, find a, find, a, find a way, find a loophole or something. And what you're basically doing is you're, you're not really giving it the thought process that it deserves. Let's recall that an error, a mistake. But why'd you make the mistake? Because you really wanted to do it. <laughs> Is you really had a personal vested interest. And, and um, at that moment, God simply wasn't a priority in your life at that moment. If you think about that psychologically, inside, and it's such an important thing for all of us as people to psychoanalyze ourselves all the time, to be thinking all the time. I mean, the rest of the world, you understand, what does the rest of the world do all day? The rest of the world does this all day. Sleep walking through life. I make this decision, this one, that one, somewhere I bump into somebody or something. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm all goofed up. You understand? That's, that, that's how the non Jews live in the world. <clears throat> Jewish people use this use your head, think, analyze. And in doing so, you have a better chance at getting, getting it right. And so the idea is to realize. That these are the sins that God's asking me to forgive, to ask for the forgiveness, to repent from. To repent means, therefore, to recognize I did this wrong. To regret being stupid. To regret being betraying. To regret having this overwhelming desire. I regret it. Because I know that brings me down. I know it makes me less of a person. I'm almost embarrassed to look in the mirror. At that point, you're doing good. You're moving forward. Because now you come to the third point. And that is recognition, regret, and resolve. I'm not going to do this again. Then maybe that someday we might. I'm not gonna, we, we may, in fact, do it again. But at this moment, I am absolutely so regretful. My resolution is firm. I am not going to do this again. That's tshuva. That's repentance. Now, <clears throat> Moshe Rabbeinu is working on the people to get them to repent from the golden calf. Do you remember why you did this golden calf? I know you got all nervous. You got nervous. I wasn't coming down on time. I was six hours late. You got all freaked out. That was dumb. Besides being dumb, you also miscalculated. Your watches were wrong. What watch they had in those days, however, they had hourglass, I don't know, but they were they miscalculated. And because you miscalculated six hours, you got all bent out of shape, and you went after a golden calf. You lusted after the golden calf. We need something, we need help, we need protection. There's no God anymore. Moses is dead. What are we gonna do? And they betrayed God. Now Moses says, Stop it. Now Moshe Rabbeinu says, Do chuba. Repent. Do you regret what you did? Do you recognize what you did is wrong? Do you recognize that because of you guys, I had to break tablets? I had to take the Torah and throw it on the floor? Did you know that? Oh, wow, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, it's all pretty heavy. And of course, we come to a regret. We're really sorry about this. Can you resolve never to do it again? So, Moshe Rabbeinu says, okay, I spent 40 days in heaven bringing the tablets and broken. I spent another 40 days keeping you guys, uh, helping you guys to do tshuva, to continuously regret, resolve, and, and, and get better. Now, how long is it now? How many months has passed already since we left Egypt? We left Egypt, counted the Omer, kept the Torah, went up 40 days, broke the tablets. Now, another 40 days for Tshuva. And you know what month it is? It's Elul. It's the beginning of Elul today. Today is the beginning of Elul. On this day, historically, Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven again. And on this day, he got a new set of tablets and brought it down to the people 40 days later to give them a second chance. And that's called 
tshuva, repentance, and that's called forgiveness. And the beauty of all this story is that it exists within our world. Our God, who created this world with a sense of truth and justice and right and wrong, does have a spot for forgiveness. You can change. But I lived my life all this way. You know, you know, you know what kind of garbage I've been eating, trafe I've been eating. You know how many Shabbos I broke? You can change. Got a second chance. Whoa, that's awesome. And um, historically, it happened during these during this month of Elul. But uh, Moshe Rabbeinu went up again on the beginning of Elul today. He had to spend another forty days. Everything's forty. Well, if he spent 40 days, that means he went beyond this month into the next month. The next month is Tishrei. He spent another 10 days into Tishrei. And on the 10th of Tishrei, he came down with a new set of tablets and called that day Yom Kippur. And that's your 40-day deal. But the 40-day deal has with it that last 10 days of increased tshuva. So you want to say that, can you do tshuva all year round? Today, I made a mistake in the middle of December. And I wanted the very next day to change and become a better person. Can I do that? Sure, you can. You do it any day. So why now? Why not particularly? So you want to say the tshuva is on sale. 50% off. You go to the store today and you want to do tshuva. Takes you half the energy, half the job, 50% off this time of the year. Why? Because this time in the year, historically, that's when we did tshuva. So just like every Pesach, we celebrate freedom because on Pesach, we have the original freedom. And every Shavuos, we celebrate the giving of the Torah because that's when we got the Torah. Every Elul, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, for those 40 days, including the apex, which is Yom Kippur, we celebrate and commemorate and redo and relive the chuba process. Once again, the chuba process, I've erred, poor judgment. I lusted, I desired, I wanted, I needed, I had to have. And so I stole a little bit, you know how it is. It's only 50 bucks. And then I also did not think about God at all. Now I therefore recognize it, regret it, and resolve to do better. That's the job in these 40 days. Now again, can we do it all year round on a personal level? Absolutely. Let's say a person is going through a life change and he really wants it changed. Like for instance, let's say he's single or she's single and he or she wants to get Married. Would you say and agree that that's a big life change? Big day. On the day you get married, you're supposed to fast because that day is like Yom Kippur. That's the Yom Kippur of all Yom Kippurs. The personal Yom Kippur. You're changing. I'm a new person. You know all those mistakes I made? All those things that when you say to your wife, to be your bride, all those times I didn't treat you properly, and all those times I was I, I didn't what wasn't compassionate. Then the and, the, and the and the bride turns to the groom and says, "You know, all those times I disrespected you and I didn't do what you'd asked me to do, and this, that, and that." A new person, we're new, whole brand new relationship. We're no longer just boyfriend girlfriend anymore, we're husband and wife. So anytime you go through a life transition. So we celebrated this past Shabbos, my grandnephew's bar mitzvah. It's a life change. Yesterday he's 12. Today he's 13. Whoa. Whole brand new life. Well, the past, gone. Gone. Well, in Yom Kippur, you can do the same. It's all gone. Remember all the mistakes you made? All those stupid things you did? Right? All the things you're ashamed of, all the things you said that you were sorry you said. All gone. This is the most beautiful time of the year. And these 40 days is when they can make the move. As I said, true was on sale, half price. Now you can do it all year round, but that's not a question. Now, half price.
And so what do we do during these 40 days? So the first thing we do is we do Elo. Now this month of Elo is not a holiday, but it leads up to a holiday. That holiday called Rosh Hashanah, followed by Yom Kippur, which means those are not the festive national holidays of joy and festivity like Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, but it's deep, personal. It is, um, of course, it's also national too. We're all doing it, but it's something that's so personal. And most of the Rosh Hashanah and Kippur is prayer. There's no lulav to shake. There's no sukkah to eat in. There's no Pesach to have. There's no matzah. None of all the other exciting things that you do on other holidays. Nothing. Just pray. Even for that matter, the holiday of Shavuot we celebrate by learning, we even diminish our learning during, during these days. Prayer, the name of the day, name of the game. And so prayer, now Rosh Hashanah prayer, well, it seems to me, it's, uh, I, I can't see a Rosh Hashanah service less than four hours, frankly. I mean, uh, whoever zooms beyond four, uh, less than four hours is zooming. <laughs> you got to have a, 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 at least four hours of dominating. I mean, I think we start, generally we start around 8 a.m. We ended two. That's Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur, it's all day. And everybody knows that we daven three times a day. Morning, afternoon, evening. Shacharit, Mincha, and Arvi. Is that right? Good enough. Everybody knows that on Shabbat and holidays, we will add a fourth prayer because it's Shabbat, it's holiday. And what's that fourth prayer called? Musaf. On Yom Kippur, we pray five times a day. You come into Yom Kippur at 8 a.m. and you leave at 8 p.m. I know mean, there's a break in between somewhere. I mean, you do have to have a break. I mean, you're only human. But basically, I don't remember ever leaving the shul on Yom Kippur. If I took a break, I sat in my chair and dozed. I don't remember. I mean, since I'm 10, probably. My father never did. We never left the show. We walked in at 8 o'clock in the morning. We sat down. Or we stood up, whatever what I had to do. And you're there for the day. It's Yom Kippur. What's Yom? The day. It's the full day. Five prayers. Who can name the fifth prayer service of Yom Kippur? Ne'ilah. Say it. Ne'ilah is correct. And when is Ne'ilah? It's the last one. There's Arvit. We start in the night. Then we go Shacharit, Musaf, Mincha. And then we go towards the end of the day as the day is winding down and as um, the, 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 the sun is setting. And when you think you're at your weakest, all of a sudden there's a resurgence of adrenaline. You know why? Because Ne'ilah means the closing of the gates. The gates that have been open for 40 days that Hashem has been wishing us and hoping for us to pray and come close to him and to forgive and to, and, and to ask for forgiveness. It's coming to a close. So what do you do when you get, when the gates are closing? You get desperate. <laughs> you get it. You bring out all the guns you got. You can bring out all the energy you got. It's your last chance for the coming year. It's the very last chance. The judge is about to wrap his gavel and, and say what's going to be for the coming year. And we all have things to pray for. Parnassah, health, family, happiness. How about let's pray. How about this to add to your prayers this year? How about a prayer to Hashem that says, Hashem, I am praying to you this year that there should be no more terrorism in Israel. How about that one? Should that be on everybody's agenda? If we pray hard enough, we can affect that. We can make that change, not just for ourselves, but for our family, for our friends, for our, for our people, for our safety, for our country. We can do this. That's what the 40 days is for, and it's half price. So how do we understand the 40 days? So the first thing we do is we say, you got to prepare. And what's the preparation? Elul. What do you think the Jews people were doing while Moses up there for the 40 days this next time? Well, they're not making no more golden calves. I'll tell you that. <laughs> right? 
What are they doing? They're doing tshuva. They're praying. They're, they're begging forgiveness. Sorry, Hashem, we did this thing terribly before. We're not going to do it again. These 40 days are intense, powerful. Moshe Rabbeinu was there, up, up there, and Hashem is judging. Should I give you a new set of tablets? Should I not? Should I give you 10 commandments again or not? And so one of the things that we did on this month is that every single day to keep people aroused and attuned to the seriousness of the situation, we blew the chauffeur. Every day this month, we blow the chauffeur. Now, what is the chauffeur? Chauffeur is a mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah, really. But every day during this month, we're going to prepare for Rosh Hashanah with a blowing. But the blowing is going to be a very uh, a, a small one. Let me explain to you how chauffeur is blown. Chauffeur has three basic sounds, and you need to memorize them. They're called tekiah, shavarim, truah. Now, the essence of it all is the truah. That's what the Torah calls. Torah doesn't say the other stuff. Torah calls simply a truah. What's a truah? So that's a machloka, the dispute in the Talmud. What is a truah? So one opinion says it's this, the kind of sound that sounds like a man sighing. Oi, oi, oi. Which is probably part of our attitude at this time. Another opinion says, no, 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 no. The real true is when a man becomes hysterical. <laughs> and of course, that's how we get these two sounds. Shvarim trua. And a third opinion says they're both. So you could have shvarim, boop, 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 trua, or put them together. Boop, 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 boop. This is the essence of the chauffeur. And you got to hear each one three times because the Torah says the word trua three times. So therefore, you have to hear the shvarim three times, the trua three times, and the combination of shvarim trua three times as well. Where does the tekiya come in? The tekiya comes in as one long sound to introduce the trua and one long sound to end that trua. So if you're doing the shvarim, you have tekiya, shvarim, Kia, three times. If you're doing trua, doot, 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 then you have tkia, trua, tkia, three times. And then if you're doing the combination, you're doing tkia, shvarm, trua, tkia, three times. You want to understand? That's how it sounds. Now, during this month of Elul, we're going to do it just once. We're going to simply do tkia, shvarm, trua, tkia, and be done. That's enough to keep you attuned and alert. And that's enough to keep you um, aware of the fact that Rosh Hashanah is coming, the Yom Kippur is coming, and get into the mode, get into the zone. And it also means one other thing too. Increase prayer, increase meditation, increase seriousness. But also one other thing, very careful. Increase carefulness with how we treat one another. Increased respect for everyone, increased sensitivity to everyone, careful against Lashon Hara, gossip and slander. Be careful. You fall into a habit. You say, oh, that guy, blah, 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 or that guy, blah, blah, blah. You got to stop that. You got to work on that. You got to get into a zone in which we're sensitive to other people at the same time as we do our service to God. With this in mind, I'm going to. Uh, uh, that's not the show for one. <laughs> but um, this is a chauffeur. And um, I'm going to try and blow it. Basically, where does the chauffeur come from? It's a horn, a ram's horn. Why the ram's horn? Hashem tells Avram Avinu, sacrifice your son, your only son, the one you love, for me. What are you prepared to do for God? 
I'll give you my son. And so Avram Avinu goes to Mount Maria, where someday will be the Beit HaMikdash, where the world, Western Wall is to this day. And what? He's ready to sacrifice his son. Now, uh, that's Avram Avinu's self-sacrifice. What about Yitzchak's self-sacrifice? Well, he doesn't tell Yitzchak what he's going for. So, but he says, let's look, my son, you and I are going to go and do this special service to God. We're going to bring a sacrifice. It's going to be beautiful and on the, uh, on the altar and so forth. And as they're going up the mountain, Yitzchak looks at his son, at his father, Avram, and he says, Avi, huh? I understand we have all the things we need. We got the knife to cut the animal. We have the fire. We have the wood. Where's the animal? And Avram says to him, God will find us the ram, my son. Why does he have the word my son? God will find the ram, my son. You're the ram. Now, at that point in time, it was me. I would have hightailed it out of there. I said, Dad, it's okay. Yeah, I understand you. I got you. <laughs> but <laughs> it's extreme. I mean, I, I don't mind being religious, but this is extreme. I'm out of here, right? But Yitzchak doesn't go. Because Yitzchak is trained with his father with the concept of sacrifice. And Yitzchak continues to go. And just at the point where Abraham Avinu is ready to cut his son's throat, Hashem stops him and says it was a test. So Avram says, okay, I, I'm glad I passed the test, but I still got to do a sacrifice. What should I do? So God says, take it easy. Don't get too religious on me. Don't touch him. Avram thought maybe to make a little touch, you know, a little cut maybe. <laughs> no, no. Why? Well, but then Avram said, but I made a bracha. You make a bracha for the mitzvah. How can I not? I, I made a bracha. With, how can I do the mitzvah without a bracha? I did a bracha without a mitzvah. God said, there's a ram over there. See that ram? You can do it on him. And the ram became holy because the ram didn't run away. You know why the ram didn't run away? It was caught in the bushes. And how was it caught by? This is the symbol of what Hashem said to Avram. You know what? You have ready to give your son to me. I'll give you a ram. I will give you every blessing possible to serve me because of your devotion to me. And the ram's horn will remain a symbol of that forever. And that's why we blow the show from Rosh Hashanah. Because on Rosh Hashanah day, that's when that story occurred. The story of Avram and Yitzchak going to the sacrifice occurred on Rosh Hashanah day. And so, um, we blow the shofar. Now, in Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to tell you a bit later, I'm going to get into it now, there's actually 100 sounds you will hear in Rosh Hashanah during the Bible. Of the 100 sounds, 30 are required by the Torah, 70 in the Rabbanan. But, for now, that's all we need to know is that the four sounds are what they are, and you try to hear them every day during this month of Elul. Now, women don't go to shul every day, understand? Um, so their son, their, their, their um, their, uh, uh, their husbands have to, uh, or fathers have to tell them, uh, you know, and share with them that the shofar was blown. But that means that the males, all males, every day need to be in shul. Every single morning. Because you want to hear the shofar, you don't want to miss the shofar. Now, this is going to go on for 30 days. And this month will become known and special because of its preparation for Rosh Hashanah, for its tshuva and repentance to God and begging for forgiveness, for the shofar that is blown, for everything that is in this sheet called the customs of the month of Elul. Let's take a look. Number one, Elul is a special time for tshuva for Hashem is closer to us than any other time of the year. That means Hashem somehow or another, I don't know how, brings himself closer, makes tshuva more accessible, and says, I'm in a forgiving mood. Come to me, my children. 
I want you now. Don't mess up. Don't lose this opportunity. This month is going to be the best month of your life. The most spiritual month of your life. The best davening of your life. And the sweetest, kindest person you could possibly be for the best time of your life this month. With this in mind, we say, the Pasuk is in the Song of Songs, and the first letters of each pos of each word in the Pasuk spell Elo. What's the Pasuk? I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. I am to Hashem, Hashem is to me. And the love relationship that we have between each other is powerful. How do we say it in Hebrew? Anila Dodi? Dodi Lee. Is that right? Ani, Aleph. Le Dodi, Lamed. Ve Dodi, Vav. Le, Lamed. You didn't get one? Sorry. Thank you. I can't separate. I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. Ani Aleph, Le Dodi, Lamid, Vidodi, Vav, Li, Lamid. The first letter of each of those words spells Aleph, Lamid, Vav, Lamid. Spells Elo. That means it's a hint there. When we find something of this kind of nature, it's not by accident. It's hinting to us there's a message. The message is the message of love between I and Hashem, Hashem and me. But I want to point out something very, very significant and show you how deep the message goes. What is the last letter of Ani? Vidodi. Ani, Lidodi. Yud. Vidodi. Li. That's four Yuds. How much is the numerical value of Yud? No. Ten. How much is ten times four? Don't jump the gun. 10 times 4 is 40. You get it? These are the 40 days. 30 of Elul plus the 10 more coming up next month. The 10 month, the 10 days of Tshuva. They're called the 10 days of Tshuva, Seven Dimei Tshuva from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. We're preparing for that right now. So let's read further. Elo is a time to prepare for the high holidays by increased feeling during prayer and more charity. That's also part of the process. Very important. Give more charity. Now's the time to give to the shul. Now's the time to find people who are, who are needy. Because there are going to be a lot of people who are needy coming up this holiday that won't have the good food you have. Make sure you find out who, of some, of some, you know, of a rabbi that has a fund to help the needy. To make sure the money is being given so that other people, other members of our family, our Jewish family, are cared for. Tzedakah is very important. We both show for every morning, number two, except Shabbos. Why don't we both show for Shabbos? It's work. It's work? Not really work. It wasn't too hot. I mean, I definitely. Right? <laughs> that really worked. And the truth is, the only reason we don't blow shofar on Shabbos is a very interesting reason. Because since you know that on Shabbos, it's forbidden to carry from private to the public and vice versa, we're afraid you might carry the shofar on Shabbat to Shul. And therefore, you, you get what I'm sorry. Okay? Therefore, we're afraid that you might carry, we don't want to break Shabbat. But on holidays, you're allowed to carry. But now when the holiday falls out on Shabbat, Shabbat then overtakes. We all know that Shabbat is a greater day than Rosh Hashanah. Shabbat is Shabbat. That's the everything. That's the cornerstone. You haven't got that. You got nothing. But understand, the Shabbat is such that when you understand the 39 forbidden things to do, then you understand how to celebrate the other holidays. The holidays take off from Shabbat. Shabbat is the cornerstone from where everything grows. How do I know how to observe the holidays? Because of the way I observe Shabbat. Except that there are three leniencies on the holidays, like I mentioned. Other than that, it's Shabbat. Therefore, if Shabbat and Rosh Hashanah or holiday coincides, Shabbat takes priority. No cooking. And no carrying. Now, we all know nowadays we all carry because we have a neighbor. Everybody knows that, right? 
kind of nice to have an air that you can carry. But I can tell you, growing up, first 20 years of my life, I never knew what I, I never even heard of a neighbor. I mean, I knew of a neighbor, but we never carried, never carried. I didn't put a handkerchief in my pocket, ever. I hope that the shul had tissues. But you understand, now we all carry. Okay, fine. Enjoy carrying. You have that opportunity. But remember that there was one such a prohibition. And therefore, if it's Rosh Hashanah and you got to blow the shofar for the congregation and you got to carry it on Shabbat, Shabbat overrides Rosh Hashanah, Shabbat overrides the shofar. And that's why if Rosh Hashanah coincides with Shabbat, there's no shofar blowing. And on the Shabbat during Elul, there's also no show for one. Good question. Um, what if you're what if there's two arrows? Do you still have to go under under the cross to carry, or do you just not carry it? Because what are you talking about? Okay, so this is one arrow, right? Yeah. And then the other one's right next to it. I was told that you can carry it if you can find an underpass to go under. <clears throat> but I don't know. I, I can't. I can't answer. I don't know. Uh, the, the the issues of air are very intricate, uh, and I do know that we have there here in our neighborhood. I do know we carry. Um, anybody here live in a neighborhood where there's no air? Yeah. You do. I, and and we're Pasadena. Who else? You. Yeah. And you two. Right. Okay. So you guys know. <laughs> you can't carry. Can't carry. Now imagine. Let's say you grew up in a neighborhood where there's an air. And all these years you carry. And one day you come to visit Baruch in Pasadena. Or you visit uh, um, uh, uh, Esti in, uh, uh, where do you live in Timbuktu? No, no. And where do you live in? <laughs> and you live, and, and Anna, there's, there's no Arab in Santa Monica? Or Venice. Oh, my goodness. Don't invite me for shoppers. <laughs> you have an Arab by you? Also not. So you can't carry. So then imagine all these years you carry, and all of a sudden you go to this neighborhood where it doesn't have a neighbor. Someone invited you for Shabbos. Oates invites me for Shabbos over there at the, with the Woodland Hills over there, and I just start carrying. Oh, no. You got to be conscious of this. To be conscious of carrying is a very interesting thing. Of all the 39 things that are forbidden on Shabbos, carrying is the slightest. Now, in a private domain, I can do whatever I want, correct? So I decide I'm going to find one of those high risers in uh, downtown LA. You know those big things being there? Or maybe the Empire State Building in New York, you know? And I'm going to take a big 100 pounds uh, suitcase, right? And I'm going to go up 100 flights in the Empire State Building in New York City <clears throat> on Shabbat. Did I violate Shabbat? No. I'm in, one, I'm in an enclosed area. But now I'm going to take a handkerchief, put it in my pocket, and walk out the door from outside, from inside to outside, and I just violate a job. It's hysterical. So we understand, therefore, the detail, the intricacy, the point. The point of the message is, is that whatever was done in the construction of the uh, sanctuary in the desert, those 39 labors become forbidden on Shabbos according to the technicality of which it was done and how it was done. And therefore, you can't uh, carry that hanky. Now we have the error, but we have to be sensitive to the fact that maybe there'll be one shul in one area where there'll be one person who will blow the chauffeur, who will forget that it's the carry. And it's Shabbat Rosh Hashanah. And for that reason, whole world over, whenever Shabbat comes on Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, there is no chauffeur. But go ahead. What about uh, carrying kids, children, strollers? Live in a neighborhood. Remember, if the kid can walk. Oh, but you're not can. Oh, so one second, you can carry a child who can walk. That is true. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, but uh, if, it, if if he can't walk, he's a baby. Child's a baby. You can't. You can't. You cannot push the stroller, nor can you carry the child. Either. Yeah. 
We, I had so I had a lot of problems with that with my kids, because you know, <laughs> we. we uh, I remember one particular Friday night that they we were walking home from from we had spent I had a dinner at, at a sheva brachas at a wedding celebration, uh, and we walked home from uh, from the shul where we had it to where we were staying, and my wife and I were walking in the child flat sat down and said I'm not going any further. It was late at night, eleven o'clock Friday night. Poor kids, I'm dying. <laughs> what am I going to do with a four year old? Tell him to keep Shabbos. <laughs> But he could walk himself. So, but if he can walk himself, it's permitted. It's actually forbidden, and it's uh, from the for, uh, unless it's a desperate situation. But in a desperate situation, it's permitted to carry the child. That is correct. I mean, again, carrying is a very serious matter. And again, we forget about it because we all have Arabs, most of us. But you have to understand that we will give up on chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah just to remind people of this rule of no carrying on Shabbat particularly when you know contradistinctively that, in fact, you can carry on Chagim and holidays. But fear not! If Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbat and Sunday, two days, you won't blow on Shabbat, but you'll blow on Sunday. And that's why Rosh Hashanah ended up two days. And there's other reasons why, but we won't get into that. In any event, so uh, let's uh, blow the chauffeur uh, every day except Shabbos. What are the four basic notes? Number two, Kia, Shvarim, Trua, Kia. Got to memorize them. And three times each. Okay, folks, do your math. And no calculators allowed. And no cell phones allowed. Do the math. If I do Kia, Shvarim, Trua, Kia, and Kia, Shvarim, Kia, and Kia, Trua, Kia, three times each, how many sounds is it? Well, no. Three times each, I said. Kia, Shvarim, Trua, Kia, three. Kia Shvarm Kia three, Kia Truot Kia three. Oh, 30. You knew already. You didn't figure it out. I know you. Because no one can figure it out. You guys don't got no math brains. You, know, you, know, you guys don't even know how to count without a calculator. But anyway, it's I'm not being fair. I apologize. Anyway, it's 30 sounds. Kia Shvarim Truot Kia. Three times, 12. Kia Shvarm Kia, three times, nine. Three times, another nine. Nine and nine and 12. Don't tell me you can't do this. <laughs> nine and nine and 12 is 30. Anyway, that's what the minimum requirement is on Rosh Hashanah. During this month, just four sounds is enough. Number three. And number two, the end. The pastor says that the chauffeur will arouse serious chuva. You hear that chauffeur? And you know what it's all about. Number three, Psalm 27, a very important psalm dealing with the salvation and the light, the light that Rosh Hashanah brings in light of judgment and the salvation of forgiveness that Yom Kippur brings and Sukkot, all is inclu included in Psalm 27. It should be recited as an addition to your shacharit, to your daily morning service every single day of this month. Number four, some of a custom, it's a Chabad custom. To recite three chapters of Tehillim, of Psalms. Now, you all know Tehillim is such an important book written by King David, most poetic, most beautiful book of songs and praises to Hashem. We should always try to say as much Tehillim as possible on occasions. But some have a custom to do three a day during this month. Chapters one, two, and three. The next day, that's today. Tomorrow, four, five, and six. The day after, seven, eight, and nine. They're beautiful chapters, do them in Hebrew, do them in English, but they really make a change in your month. And that's what you want to do. You want to change yourself during this month. Number five, it is appropriate to study the book, The Ways of Life, written by the Rush. You can get it online. You can get it in bookstores. It's a magnificent book with 131 liners of how to improve your life. It's called The Ways of Life. It was written by the Rush. The Rush lived at the same time as Rashi and the Rambam about uh, 800, 900 years ago. It's still studied to this very day. The, the, book? the book is The Ways of Life. And I might, uh, I might mention the, to you, the, the, the author, Rabbeinu Usher. Usher. Usher was known as The Rush. And I might mention also that uh, this book, The Ways of Life, is a book that, um, that um, is the, these one liners are divided into days of the week. Uh, so let's, have, let's say if there's 130 of them, I believe it's 130. So maybe you learn maybe uh, 15 a day 
or so, and they're all one-liners. If you can't do it all, so you do half of it, do as much as you can. But you'll find that they're illuminating, they're exciting. They're, they're just tell you insights to life, like, wow, this is the better way to live. This is beautiful stuff. This is great wisdom. And I've been doing this for years. And it's, it's a, in fact, in, in, in the yeshiva in Lakewood, New Jersey, where there's uh, over 7,000 students, that yeshiva recites this on a daily basis every day of this month, the ways of life. Salichot, for the Sephardim, it begins now. Ashkenazim, it begins a week, the last week in the month. But either way, Salichot is recited every morning before Shacharit, and with a special service recited on the, on the Saturday night, Motzei Shabbat, before Rosh Hashanah at midnight. That means, uh, Yesterday was September 3rd? No, yesterday was August 27th. The following Shabbat is also September 3rd. So the last Shabbat in the year will be September 24th, and the week before that, September 17th. September 17th, midnight, men and women are invited to the midnight service of Salichot. In all the respective shuls, they're all open. Everybody's there. Men come, women come. It's at least a one-time Salichot you can do, and that's September 17th at midnight. What is the Salichot all about? Number seven. It contains two essential prayers. Vidui, confession. Very important. By the way, if you want a more elaborate explanation about how you confess, there's a booklet out there. It can cost you more than $5. You got it in any of the bookstores. It's called Vidui. It's a great book to have. I use it as a companion when I pray on, on Yom Kippur, this book. It's a great book to have. A booklet. Uh, Vidui, confession. And that's extremely important. Because why? Because we mentioned that tshuva is what? Recognition, regret, and resolve. But all that doesn't work unless you verbally say it. You got to say it. Now, the guy I might get a sacrifice to confess to your priest or whatever. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not available for that. <laughs> right? You confess to God. But you got to say it. You got to say the words. And the Vidui booklet will give you a tremendous understanding of what you're saying. Oh, there it is. There's an example of it. Thank you. This is the booklet. Can't cost more than $5. All the bookstores have it. Just go in and say, give me a Vidui booklet. It will open your eyes to understand what you're really saying, what you're confessing for. And besides, you'll also find out something very interesting. You'll find out stuff here that you probably did that you didn't know was wrong. <laughs> um, the other important thing of Salichot is the 13 attributes of Hashem's mercy. The 13 attributes of Hashem's mercy was first used by Moshe Rabbeinu to ask God to forgive the Jews for the golden calf. It is recited in Salichot by the congregation and it's done with a congregation only, but you can study it. I have a one pager on it if anyone wants it. Uh, maybe I'll just take the list of people here and then and I'll email it out to you. The 13 attributes of mercy show you how Hashem, how his mercy operates, how his forgiveness operates. And it's a good thing to have and it's a good thing to recite. Number eight, the day before Rosh Hashanah, Erev Rosh Hashanah Sunday, September 25. Tomorrow we're going into court. Have you prepared? It is a custom to fast half a day. It is also to recite longer salichot prayers than, ever, than usual. It is appropriate for the men to go to mikveh, purify yourself, dress festive, assured of God's mercy and judgment. We could be assured of God's mercy. See, yeah, you should be afraid of the judgment, absolutely. But you also have to be confident. Confident. Assured, God is merciful. Can you manage that balance and not get smug about it? I still remain fearful, frightened, and still feel confident. It's a challenge. Now, number nine, it is appropriate for everyone to ask forgiveness from one friend to the other. For two, it does not guarantee forgiveness for sins you committed against someone else unless the other person forgives you himself. That means what? That means if I spoke bad about you, I hope not. 
and I don't ask for forgiveness, God is not going to forgive me for that sin. God will forgive me for I forgot, that I forgot the daven. God will forgive me they ate the wrong thing. God will forgive me that I um, uh, that I may, wasn't careful with Shabbat. But God will not forgive you if you offended someone, hurt someone, embarrassed someone. Unless you ask that person forgiveness first. Oh, Yehuda, forgive me. You forgive me, Yehuda. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You forgive me? Thank you. You forgive me or not? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 that's a prayer. How about if the guy doesn't forgive you? Let's say, okay, that's a good one. How about if the guy doesn't forgive? Yes, the guy forgives us. The guy doesn't say, the guy doesn't want to forgive you. So you're supposed to go back and ask him three times. After that, you can punch him in. And, no, 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 no. <laughs> Take that back. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, but, but ask the guy three times. That should be sufficient. After three times, he doesn't forgive you. It's okay. You can rest easy, but you should ask. Yeah, and, and people should be forgiving. There is a prayer, by the way, I'll talk about it later, on Yom Kippur about how to forgive we'll th between people. We'll talk about that uh, at some other time. Yeah. What do you want to ask? Oh, you, know, you just wanted me to, you just wanted to forgive me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to forgive. I know. I know it's tough. I know. I know. I know. I got to forgive. What can I in terms of when he forgives, uh, for 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 the for the asking or to get or to receive or the answering. Well, yeah, you should make sure to ask before the holiday. That's what's written in here. Make sure to do so the day before Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Or there is a uh, uh, what other good good cute terms are there out there? I mean, uh, I mean, basically before Rosh Hashanah. Try to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Frankly, he should be, and I'll tell you why. Because even though a Jew is your own people, and that's that that's your priority, but the reality is is that it's wrong to be mean to anybody, and it's a blemish on your character if you insulted the uh, the guy who's painting your house just because he's not Jewish. Right. I mean, if you want to tell me he did the wrong thing, that's okay. But you want to tell me you're an idiot. You can't do that. I mean, <laughs> you know? So, so, so uh, you should try to ask forgiveness from anybody that you offended. On the other hand, of course, you might find some people that you offended that you don't know if you offended them, or that you can't find them. Or the guy lives in New York. What are you going to do? So, there's a special prayer that we say on Yom Kippur. We'll talk about it later on. That helps you to uh, to get into that to, to achieve that. But. On a personal level, we all should be doing that. And again, this is your checklist. Keep this. This is for you to keep. I printed it out for you not to discard, but for you to really think about doing these things this month. And if, let's say, you meet someone in two weeks whom you will not see later on, Rosh Hashanah, ask him, none to ask him then. If you're going away to Israel, then you better <laughs> ask for forgiveness, right? Uh, so these are the laws and customs. I want to just review once again that this is a month for uh, five achievements. So we talked about the um, the, the three uh, R's of uh, of tshuva, uh, recognition, regret, resolve. We talked about the three kinds of sins: error, um, uh, error, desire, and uh, and betrayal of Hashem. And I want to just mention to you uh, the. Uh, things we should be working on during worship, during this month, and they are. Um, let's leave it at three things. Stay with the number three all, all the way around. Shuva, repentance, and that means what we just talked about, about the three kinds of sins, the three kinds of recognition, uh, and, and, you know, doing a lot of thinking. A lot of thinking, and uh, if you have free time during the day, it's a great time to think. If you don't have free time, make some free time. Uh, but, but you got to do a lot of thinking. Um, and thinking, don't be afraid of thinking either. It, 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 it's liberating. It really is. Um, uh, you, you, you feel so, so, sometimes sad, and sometimes maybe even you cry. And this and that. You know, by the way, on Rosh Hashanah prayers, there's a lot of crying. There really is. Yom Kippur, for sure. I never saw a shul that doesn't cry in Yom Kippur. The shul is crying. The songs are crying. 
But you know, um, and that's and that's healthy too. That, that's cathartic. It helps. It helps you to to to, to get an idea of, of how you want to become better and change and improve and stuff. Um, but in addition, um, uh, you 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 should you shouldn't be afraid of of all the stinky because it does it does liberate. It, it it gives you a chance to really feel better about yourself. You're not such a bum. You're you're you're, you're good because you're you're thinking in these in, in, in positive terms. Yes. Why, um, okay, I, I want to talk about this walk. Every time I hear the Chopin. What, what? Why every time that I hear the Chopin, I'm pretty sure it happens to many people. Right. I cry for no reason. I cannot stop it. Me too. What is it? Me too. But so why? I don't know. <laughs> 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 it is what it is. The show was supposed to arouse you. It does the job. Wow. Great show, by the way. Um, and I'll blow one more time for everybody. But, but, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but so that's number one. Number two, prayer. Davin has got to be stronger, longer, more intense, more thoughtful, uh, more attendance at the shul, more connection. Uh, uh, it can't be, you know, like a regular day, a regular diving every every day. You put on film, and, oh, okay, goodbye, God, and get to work. You know, what I mean, it, it's got to diving's got to change. The intensity's got to change. The comfort has got to change. The feeling's got to change. Well, God, I I don't really pray like this all year round. You know, I just pray like this now. Do I feel like a hypocrite? Absolutely not. You know why? No one can maintain top level concentration forever or all the time, but you can build up inside you power to, at certain moments. So why not do it? You know, it is the seventh game for the World Series. You know, anyone who plays baseball, <laughs> this is it. This is, a, this is the Super Bowl. <laughs> you ever know that? The Super Bowl of Judaism. 